So now let's take a look at a, a pattern that is reified in many frameworks, the fork and join. This is a concurrent fork join. So we've seen some examples of messages that, um, that fan out, right, using the, the broadcast behavior and things like that. Um, one of the simple patterns is something where you want to start two concurrent activities and you need to wait for them both to complete before you can finish your work. Right? So that's the case where you're going to want to use something like a fork join. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to assume the existence of a couple of services here. And they're trivial services. When they receive a message, one returns the answer 0, one returns the answer 1. doesn't matter what message they receive. And then I'm going to create this fork. And that's done by this behavior here. So what, I'm, what I've done here is I've created an actor that specifically has a customer, in this case, an, an output customer. It's going to print the result. Uh, and a reference to a head and a tail actor. And this is an example of a pattern that I would call work order, which is, since actors are cheap to create, we sometimes will want to create an actor that reifies the logic to go through the process of getting some work done. So this would be, um, an example of this might be the difference between defining a parse, uh, a parser, and the process of parsing a particular stream. The process of parsing a particular, the parser might be static, but the process of parsing is a dynamic, stateful thing. So that would be uh, something you might create as a work order. Another way you might do that is expression evaluation. The expression itself has a structure, but the process of evaluating that expression in a certain context is going to be dynamic and unfolding, so it's often good to send a message to the structural thing that creates an, a work order that handles the instance of the processing that needs to be done. So what I'm doing here is I've created a work order for I, I want you to handle a single pair of requests and collect their results and send them back to me. So this is not something that I would construct statically, but I would construct dynamically when I want to make a call like this. All right, so I've created a structure here that created uh, two instances of, of this tag behavior. And we'll talk about the, the purpose of that in a second. And then I'm going to send messages. So I haven't received a message on, on the fork yet. But as soon as I have, when I receive this message, this is going to be the head request and the tail request, I'm going to send these messages to the two processes. And then I'm going to construct these actors that are waiting to join the result. So in one of these messages, so you'll see that there was a customer originally initialized here that the join remembers. I'm sending the two requests. And then when I send the request onto the actual service, instead of supplying the original customer, I supply a reference to this actor that I've created, one each for head and, and tail. Okay, so both messages are sent. From the perspective of the join, because I've become a join now, from the perspective of the join, this, uh, the head reference is the first actor, and the tail reference is the, is the rest. From the perspective of head and tail, the join is the customer in both cases. And they are instances of this tag behavior. All the tag behavior does is adds its own identity to the message. What use is that? What this does for me is it's another kind of pattern that I call an authorization key. And this can be used for security reasons. Um, in this case, it's used primarily just to coordinate the algorithm. I need to be able to distinguish one, of, one side of this computation from the other. When the join receives a message, it could be receiving it from either side. So it's going to need to identify where it came from. Now, I could, in this case, have probably just tagged it with a label like one or two and, and said, by convention, one of them returns a one and the other one returns a two. What I'm showing instead is that by creating this tag instance and using its own identity, I've actually created an unforgeable key that only that actor can send. And since I created it in the fork behavior, the only actor that knows that key to begin with is the fork and the actor that got created. 
So they have a shared secret. So when I use this shared secret, I can create uniquely identifiable, secure communication between any pair of actors, and I don't have to worry about someone injecting a message that happens to have a reference if this was uh, an outward-facing interface somewhere. Okay? So this is, this is a technique that has a little bit more power than I need for this particular case, but it works uh, pretty well to identify the two sides of the fork. All right. So what ends up happening now is each of these services received a message. The one service responds back to its customer, which is the tail. And the tail receives that message. And, of course, it's going to be this tag behavior. So it's going to tag that message with its own identity and send it on. Okay? So what's been added here is it's the same message, but there's a reference back to the tail. So what will end up happening now is that the join receives that message, and it's going to come into this, to this match. And basically, it's got two pairs that says, is the value of k first or the value of k rest the first token in this particular pattern. So I've got here is a split pattern because I've got a, I've got a variable that's going to bind first, is going to bind to whatever happens to be in that position. And the dollar sign says this is not a binding position, this is a value. I need to evaluate it as the value of this thing, act, act as if it's a constant. Evaluate that expression act if it, as if it's a constant. So this is the way that I make sure that I know which side of the fork the answer came from. And I'll change the behavior of the actor to one of these two behaviors based on whichever message I received. So in this case, I received the rest part first, so the rest arrows match up. The state of my object now changes to a representation that says, I don't know what's on the first side, but the second part's one. And now I, I've essentially become this behavior, and now I'm only waiting for the other side. Okay? So no matter which side I've, I've picked here, I'm using lexical scoping to hang on to the value of the variable that I bound, becoming a, a new behavior, waiting for the next message to come in, and that's going to fill in the other side of that, that equation in either case. Okay, so we can walk through the same process where zero sends a message. Pull it out here where we can see it better. That zero gets processed and sends that message to the original customer, which was print. Now, what I've shown by some of these relationships and actors fading out of existence is, uh, you notice there's no actual deletes here, there's no kill, there's no you know, finish the thread or thread end. This is garbage collection. As soon as there's no references to something, it's effectively invisible to the system. The garbage collector can come along and clean it up. So that's what I'm representing by things just vanishing out of existence. Okay. So again, this is another instance of a state machine. The, the fork goes through the states of being ready to receive uh, are ready to receive a request, sending out a request and creating the two tagged um, customers to receive the results. That's one of those proxy customers I was talking about. Uh, the state of being a join, ready to receive either value, and then once it's received one of the values, changing its behavior to, to the state where it receives one, one or the other remaining value and knows which one it's in. So this is a little bit more complex state machine. <laughs> 